Welcome back to The Breakfast here on PLOS TV Africa. It's time for Today in History, and I'm going back to the year 2008. We're once again going to be sharing a story of a bombing of oil pipelines. This took place in 2008, a day after the movement for the emancipation of uh, the Niger Delta leader then, uh, Henry Oka, was, of course, uh, to, uh, well, the government had declared that he will be tried in secret. Uh, three pipelines were on this day blown up by militants from uh, the movement for the emancipation of the Niger Delta and of course forced uh, Royal Dutch Shell to halt 170,000 barrels per day of oil exports. Uh, MEND eventually claimed responsibility for that attack and of course it aided in pushing oil prices to a record $120 a barrel in this, uh, on this day in uh, 2008. Um, sometime last week we had shared you know, a similar occurrence and I was saying then that this was a period where it was uh, pretty common and that was what we in Nigeria knew then as um, attacks on Nigeria's facilities, very, very different from what we are seeing today where uh, lives are being lost um, in, in their dozens and in their hundreds across the country. Um, but this was, you know, in the time when uh, the movement for the emancipation of the Niger Delta was still very popular um, among the news stories in Nigeria for kidnappings and for bombings of uh, oil facilities and, uh, and, and the likes. Um, um, oil companies at this time also uh, paid dearly, um, you know, paying out uh, ransoms and, of course, uh, having to fix um, oil pipelines. And you can also, um, I, I think I will also mention that some of these uh, bombings also led to, may not you know, make a large percentage, but it does, uh, should be also named, led to the pollution in the Niger Delta. This happened in Biosa State. And so when we're talking about cleanup of the Niger Delta and the oil pollution that has occurred there over years, um, it, it should also be mentioned, I believe, that uh, some of the bombings of oil pipelines also led to uh, the uh, pollution of the waters and of the natural resources of the, of, uh, of the Niger Delta. Even if yes, it's still the, the oil company's responsibility to clean up and to fix uh, the damage that has been caused. Uh, but it was on this day that three oil pipelines were bombed. And of course, um, um, it was the day after Henry Oka's, uh, the government had declared that Henry Oka will be tried in secret. Yes, and they continued to uh, threaten that they'll bomb more, you know, oil in infrastructure installations and all of that you know because the demands are not being met the infrastructure decay in that area of nigeria and just so you know when you assume that you know a people who are resident in an area with so much wealth you know you you, sh you would imagine that these people would be one of the most you know affluent basically yeah. in nigeria but it's the reverse is the case but these bombings do not, they do make a statement, but it doesn't go beyond the destruction, right? What steps does the government do afterwards? We see now they're still battling the derivation fund and all of that. So a holistic approach to governance really is what we need, like Mr. Tunde Kolawole just said on Off the Press. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, they, in 10 seconds, I'll also mention, you know, that I, I, unfortunately when we have these conversations and when these actions are taken, you know, I, I always like to remind people that um, the failure of government is not just in, uh, from Asso Rock. You know, it also is in your government house, um, in each of these uh, oil producing states. It's also in your local government offices in these oil producing states. And so the focus should also be on, you know, uh, in, in those people. Um, all the money that has been paid out to these militants, the amnesty that was granted them, the billions of naira that have been given in contracts to these people, has not in any way changed or affected the lives of the people of the Niger Delta. And so the agitations um, and whatever it is that they have achieved and received from the agitations has not in any way changed much with regards to the uh, quality of life of the people of the Niger Delta. So. Um, the focus, once again, should never just be, in, you know, on Asso Rock. It should be in the governance at the very, very local level mm -hmm. and the closest level to you. All right. So next, I'm talking about a story that happened in 2007. This story remains a mystery till now. And as far back or as early as 2019, Netflix released a documentary about this, you know, very sad event that occurred in the year 2007. On this day in history, May 3rd, 2007, a three-year-old British girl by the name Madeleine McCann disappears in Portugal. So her family had gone on a vacation from the United Kingdom to southern Portugal. And, you know, the parents had been checking up on the kids, you know, checking up on them. And they discovered that Madeleine was nowhere to be found. She was not in her room with her, you know, her siblings. They searched for her everywhere. 
you know there were lots of media trials at that time especially you know b because the media had you know insinuated that the parents may have had a hand in the disappearance of their little girl madeline you know so they basically you know subjected them to lots of that and you had newspapers then especially the express newspapers later issuing apologies to the parents you know for insinuating that they had a hand in the you know abduction or kidnap of of madeline so basically the parents are still looking for their daughter many years later the documentary on netflix i watched that you know a while back and you could still see the hope in the parents eyes even though police say it's likely that you know she's dead she she went missing when she was just three years old you know police say it's likely that she's dead but the parents say no that they have the belief that she'll be found alive you know it's almost you know 14, 15 years after she went missing at the age of three in 2007. You know, there was a, there was a suspect who was arrested, a 43-year-old German, you know, but he was never, he, he, basically he was called in for questioning, but he was never arrested because they, they didn't find any leads. So basically this, like I mentioned, is the most reported missing persons case. You know, the parents went all out involving the media. Like I told you, yep. do you know what it means to do a documentary, an eight-part documentary series, you know, about the life of Madeline and, you know, the parents just sharing about, you know, their little girl, you know, newspapers, you know, publishing the story. And it's just so sad. I mean, look, at it. that's the cover of, you know, the Netflix series, The Disappearance of Madeline McCann. And the parents just still have hope in their hearts that their daughter will be found alive. Well, yes, and I remember um, when this year was really, really big. It was on all the major news uh, channels uh, across the world. It, you know, it even got to a stage where I think Theresa May um, and uh, the British government had to also step in, you know, with their own investigations and with their own, you know, level of support with the hopes of still finding her. Um, you know, for, for a very, very long time, um, there has been conversations on human trafficking and, and um, um, sexual uh, slavery and all of that, you know, across the world. Um, this is one of those incidents where some of those, you know, conversations came up once again. Um, how does a three-year-old girl just disappear um, at from night? Her room. From You know, from her room. And, and that's one of the reasons why, people, you know, the media and some per persons started to blame the parents also. There were insinuations that it was a domestic accident that led to her death, and so they had to then act like, you know, she was uh, taken or she was missing. Because um, it makes and um, still made no sense, you know, whatsoever that she just disappeared um, um, at night. They had gone on a dinner. Uh, the children were at home. Um, sometime around 8.30 or so, they got back by 10 o'clock, and that's why I think it was around 10, 10 p.m. that they realized that she was missing, and you know, the search for her started. I think there was also a little criticism of the delay in you know, finding out when she was missing and then the time that they eventually reported to the police. Um, so it's a really sad case. Um, I would also stay on the side of the parents and hope that she's still alive somewhere safe, um, and she will be found someday um, in this life. Nobody yes. knows um, you know, where she is. I mean, we've had her. cases like this. People go missing for years and years, yep. and they, you know, they show up somewhere. Hopefully she, she, hopefully, she is still found someday. Uh, Madeline McCann, uh, once again. All right, those, those are our stories for you today in history, April 3rd. Uh, take a short break. When we come back, we're talking COVID-19. India has been, in the last couple of weeks, been ravaged. The surge has been mind-blowing. Over 400,000 cases, it is record insane. high it is insane. in a day. And there's, there's, of course, a country is now starting to take steps to ensure that they do not get to experience that type of surge. There's a new strain, I believe, that um, has also been reported uh, for the large numbers of infections in India. And so we're talking about that next. Nigeria has banned flights from Turkey, from India, and from Brazil. Um, is that the right move? Is it too little, too late? How can Nigeria also ensure that we do not experience what India is currently um, dealing with? We'll be back after the short break.